me and put it in perspective that perhaps was not possible even two months ago, I'm not sure. But I think you brought up some incredible points that I would like to go back over and um, reinforce with my cheerleaders, with my pom-pom <laughs> style. Uh, but first I want to um, give you a little bit of information about heritage preservation and how I happen to be standing here. Um, I've been involved in emergency preparedness activities from working on D-Plan. Now, do all of you have a D-Plan in place? Yes? No? Yes. Yes, I won't. Yes. What happens in Munson stays in Munson. I won't report it. <laughs> Rob and, and Gregor, close your eyes. All right, so, so anyway, we'll talk about disaster plans in a minute. So I was involved in the creation of D-Plan. Um, I was involved in the development of the COSTEP project. Um, I'm working on the COSTEP HMGP grant. Um, in the meantime, somewhere in there, the, the opportunity came up to become the Vice President of Emergency Programs at Heritage Preservation, which is a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. that advocates for the protection of cultural property. Well, I thought it would be really great to go down to D.C. and I thought, okay, I'm going to ask my husband over wine some Friday night whether he wouldn't mind going down to Washington, D.C. since the kids are grown up. And I hadn't even uncorked the wine and I brought it up and he said, I'm not leaving Lincoln, Massachusetts. <laughs> what? So anyway, it worked out great. I'm telecommuting from home. Um, I have to get dressed up today, which I don't usually do. My, my summer uniform is um, consists of flip-flops, shorts, and a t-shirt, so it's really great to sort of get into the real world every now and then. So, first let's start with some questions. I'm sure some of you have questions for our panel. I have some, but any questions? If you can recall back to this morning's stellar activity. Questions? Yes, go ahead. I was very surprised when Katie said that you said your staff wasn't allowed to report to the library to help after the disaster because you know we plan for our you know our staff and we do training and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about who made those decisions and you know it's one of all right let, oh, let me just I'm sorry let's repeat the question yes let me just paraphrase it greatly <laughs> so when Katie was told that the staff could not report to the library the what how why was that and what what happened to evolve to be able to enable them to be able to report? It is a good question. It was, it, and it came out of the blue for me. It was unexpected. Uh, this was the building inspector who made this determination uh, that it was not safe in here for anyone but me to be here and the work crews, all the various work crews. Um, I only went with that for about a week. And then I said, to protect the integrity of the collection, remember those words. Um, and because I can't possibly be here every second of every day, which I was trying to at the beginning, uh, I need my staff in here. And of course, we have a lot of work to do. For the first week, it didn't matter. There was no electricity, there was no internet, you know, there was absolutely nothing to do except work with the workers. But that was from the building inspector, and I did as much as I could to go along with everything he said and to comply, comply, comply. It, there was a lot of extra effort on our part and throughout the town, but that's where it came from. So it was a town decision? It was a town decision, and in the future, the town is planning on creating badges for only two people per build, public building, I've been told. Only two people who can get in and out of town and in and out of that building. So you're really on your own. I mean, if your collections had been more impacted, that would have been a different story. That would have been different. Yes. Yes. Um, and it could have been nobody in the building, actually, if it was that bad. Now, if I can add to that, basically it goes back to the issue of, um, of personal safety in the building. And there are times when you may not be allowed back in the building because of the, the damage that, that's occurred to one way or the other. So it's important to work with the people in advance in order to be able to understand, for them to understand why it is that you need to be back and to make it facilitate that possibility um, in the event of a major disaster and to work with them in relation 
relation to the, if the building is unsafe, how are you going to deal with things? Uh, because if, in this case, it was a quote unquote dry disaster. If it had been a wet disaster, as occurred particularly in relation to Vermont and New York in the following tropical storm I read, um, you may be, and it's in the summer, uh, you may be dealing with the issue of mold growth, et cetera. And so this is the kind of thing that working with these people in advance. And you still may not be able to get in because of the condition of the building, but that's what it's going to be. It's going to come from safety issues. Jack. <clears throat> Again, just to add, you know, almost with greater stand of evening, but uh, it's a shameless plug for the planning that I think you're going to be talking about. It, it seems to me these are local issues, but like John was saying, get to meetings, you know, in your local community and also with the state. And if it can become part of your plan, what you what your needs are, and then like Greg says, work with the building inspectors or the whoever it is in your local community that you have to, and find out from them what is it we would need in order for us to get in there. Do we need some safety uh, training that we would take once a year? Is there an exercise we could do once a year to qualify us for being able to come in? So it's like a, a lot of negotiations and so forth. But uh, it does seem like it's pretty critical not just to have one person here, but to get about the business that you need to get about you know, doing. Well, we were told that what I needed to do to get my staff in here was to A, fix all the broken windows and get all the glass removed, which was a big, a big problem. Um, that was key but also that I needed scaffolding put over the entranceways so that nothing would fall on anyone, even my staff coming in and out of the building. And that, so that was why we couldn't come in. It was, it was strictly safety, 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 safety. So as, as much as going to a number of meetings and planning and knowing emergency personnel would have been <laughs> nice, it wouldn't have had any effect on this. I think this uh, leads nicely into, uh, especially that we're talking in terms of planning, to sort of assess your collection and maybe, you know, we all know that there's prime parts to our collection and maybe it leads nicely into thinking about digitizing the collection and, you know, there is uh, an opportunity through the Digital Commonwealth to actually get some of your collection, especially the most prime parts. Um, digitized and it's a free, uh, free opportunity, uh, there's going to be a second round starting. And, you know, we all know what parts of our collection are the most precious to us and um, see if that's an option. I mean, it may not always be an option, but it might be something to at least avert some of the, to mitigate some of the potential problems that you could have so that you have some other access to that really special part of your collection. Actually, in identifying the parts of your collection that are the most important is a key factor in relation to developing your disaster plan. Because you don't want people to spend all their time on your new fiction that you've just gotten in that you know you can replace, whereas they're leaving the local history collection or your reference collection or whatever, whatever you've identified as the potential, the real key parts to your collection aside while somebody's spending their time on the uh, on the stuff that you know you can replace. So if one of the components that deals with the issue of planning and putting together a disaster plan. And John made the comment, he said, unfortunately, and he's right on target, a lot of the disaster plans, people finish them, they go, good, that's done. Put it on the shelf and let it sit there. Uh, disaster plan doesn't sit there. It has to be worked. It has to be updated. It has to be dealt with on a regular basis. There are things that change. But one of the best ways to work on it, putting together a disaster plan is to work together with other institutions. There are a lot of things within putting, in putting together a plan that are common to the library, the town hall, the, the, the uh, historical society, the museum, et cetera, et cetera, and also with other communities in the vicinity. So they're putting it together in a cooperative manner. You can deal with a lot of the core stuff that deals with everybody, and then you deal with your own components. But don't let it sit on the shelf and collect dust. Are there any other questions? Can I ask yeah. about the data? Sure. Um, I don't know what you guys do to back up your data. We have a server, um, which we think we have a pretty good method of backing up. We back it up to an external hard drive, which goes home with our administrative assistant. We also back it up to my laptop, which I can take home with me. Um, that could have been very bad because her house was very 
narrowly missed by the tornado, and my laptop was still here. Um, so you need to think about that too. Do you back up your server? If you lose your budget, how much is that going to screw you up? And all of our stuff that we do have digitized from our archives is on that server. But we could have lost it all in one little swoop just by the fact that I was still here and the server was there and her house was a bare third of a mile out of the path. Very, very close. Um, so think about that too. That's important. So this all underscores the importance of planning. And as Betsy was pointing out, digital collections are pretty much an unseen part of your collection. You don't think of them, you don't see them automatically. So put in place the kinds of strategies that you need so you, you can be certain that when something happens, you're trying to think outside of the box, you're not thinking, well, this is what always happens, this is how I normally would protect it. Now that you've gone through a disaster or you've, you've escaped a, a, a recent disaster, it's really important to be able to be thinking beyond that box. So I want to focus a little bit on, um, on encouraging you all to work on your disaster plans. As Gregor said, they're evolving documents. They're not something that um, sit on the shelf. And Katie demonstrated such incredible um, coolness and decision, great decision making in the face of, of an impending disaster. And you have to be, you have to be credited for your cool thinking and decisive moves that really save lives. Um, a disaster plan will help you with that because if you are in total shock, if you really can't think straight, you can still probably read. And you'll have those steps, hopefully, written out in your disaster plan so you don't have to be doing that critical thinking at that point. You're going to be referring to the disaster plan and you'll be able to sort of be doing it almost by rote. So that, again, underscores the importance of having a disaster plan. Um, setting salvage priorities, as Gregor had said. Again, you may not be able to save everything in your collection, but certainly if you know what's valuable and what really underscores the mission of your collection, if you have established a relationship with the local emergency responders, perhaps at a, at a time sooner than normal, you might be able to go in there and, and salvage some of those materials, take them away from harm. Um, also, how many of you have a, a disaster recovery company or more, one or more, listed in your disaster plan? A couple of you do. And we have some representatives here from Belfort and Rapid Refile. These are people you need to get to know. And you, get, you need to get to know them, um, not when you place the phone call and say, Hi, Rapid Refile, I have you in my disaster plan. And they say, and who might you be? <laughs> so it's important for you to have this discussion beforehand because they, can, they, they will know what your collections can, consist of. They will know the quantities of your materials. So when that fateful day comes, when, not if, you will have that information when you call James or when you call, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Clay. Clay. Um, they will know something about your institution. They will know you. Uh, they might not be responding just to you. If this is an area-wide disaster, they might have the, their phone might be running on, uh, ringing off the hook. So having that pre-established relationship is very, very important. Laura, yes. Can I pick up on that? Two things. Um, one company that's not here today is Polygon, and they're the ones that currently have the contract with us to deal with public libraries, and so that they will uh, call us, and we will get them to you uh, in any event. Um, and that's that's the important thing in relation. I have absolutely no problem working with Clayton or James. I've worked with both of them in, in, in a number of situations. But if you want to deal with a potential for some reimbursement on, on costs that are over and above what the insurance company uh, will cover, then you need to go with us through, um, through Polygon. Otherwise, um, Free to call. We are instigating and literally meeting tomorrow afternoon to start the process of putting together a statewide, uh, an RFR for statewide contracts for companies to be able, beyond Polygon, to be able <coughs> to be able to respond in the event of big disasters. So that we have on state contract those that uh, are ones that we know are uh, reputable. And I don't know if you guys are reputable. But that's <laughs> Um, that are reputable and know how to deal with collections, not just the building. 
And I think that one of the things that, we, that I've discovered in the years that I've been at the board is that there are recovery firms out there, most of which are franchised, but in a situation where they're used to working with disasters, but in homes, and they work with them in relation to uh, the, the structural component of it and not the collections. So that uh, in a number of situations, I've actually come in and had to countermand what they're doing because they're doing the things that actually are creating more problems rather than fewer problems. So it is, a, it is an issue, and there aren't that many firms out there that really deal with collections. We have two of them here today. So that it's something to be able to really think about um, in relation to it. And Lori is so true. Uh, if I can diverge on a quick uh, anecdote. Uh, following Hurricane Katrina, the archivist of the notorial archives in uh, New Orleans, a woman named uh, Ann Wakefield, who hadn't been there that much, didn't have a disaster plan. But the notorial archives are those, uh, the archives that hold records that go back to 1742. Their birth, death, marriage, and real estate, in, in addition to other things, records for all the parishes in the, in the greater New Orleans area. And without that, nobody had information on the property, nobody had information on uh, the home, the real estate, uh, uh, any other the records were there. Uh, her situation was that, uh, as she described it to me, the 60,000 volumes that were in the, the basement of the city hall, and the big question, the amazing thing about it was that they only got six inches of water and two sleeves. Um, but that in going through the, uh, her Rolodex, Munders, who was what calling on is now, was there and she called them and then contact had been made with Munders beforehand. So as a result, they were able to go in under National Guard, Protection to be able to get in there and to be able to deal with the, the, the volumes that were there and eventually they opened up in the beginning of the middle of October, um, only about six weeks after the, the hurricane. But had she not had that contact before, she wouldn't have been able to get to make contact with them in relation to, as Lori said, who are you? Um, there is sort of a, as she told me, she said, there was a little bit of a, a, a surreptitious activity going on in the sense that one of the radio stations had gotten the information apparently that one of the things that was in the archives was an original copy of the Louisiana Purchase. She said, we don't have the Louisiana Purchase, but I wasn't going to tell them otherwise because that meant we could get into there a lot sooner than we would have otherwise. <laughs> So making so you've got polygon when you're dealing with public libraries, but if it's if you need to do it beyond and they're dealing with it, otherwise we've got others who are more equally qualified. Um, if you pull out Katie's wonderful handout, I just wanted to go over some of the points that she has here. Um, on the second page, the day after, you should actually take what she's listed here and use that as you prepare and plan because you really want to be able to do all these things and have planned to respond and not as, as wonderfully as Katie did, to have to face all these, all these challenges. And so for instance, call your insurance company and adjuster. You know, you should have this information in your disaster plan so you're not frantically trying to figure out who it is and what the name of your agent might be and, and what the name of the company should be. Now again, if you're working with your, um, through your town, that's another level that you're going to have to work through. And so, was that a challenge for you, or was that? Did you were you able to pass it off? Or did it just have to go off? So I did it all. You had to do it all. Wow. Okay. Uh, let's see. Notify CWMR to take your library off the ILO list. So it'd be really great, and we'll have a discussion a little bit uh, later on about having procedures in place in order to be proactive. So now that CW Mars knows that this is a real possibility, CW Mars should work on procedures so they automatically know to start contacting the libraries that have been affected by a disaster so they can be reaching out. So if you're not the one constantly trying to think of everything that has to be done, you're, you're getting help, you're getting reaching hands reaching out to you from the other side, I think that would be great. Um, have a COOP plan, a continuity of operations plan. 
how so many of our disaster plans uh, focus on responding, responding certainly to the people, but also to the collections. But then how are you going to start getting your services up and running again? That's so vitally important if you want to continue your mission. And by having a sense of what can be done and what, what you need to work through in advance, you'll certainly be in a better position to move forward from that. Wear heavy boots, old clothes, and work gloves. Being the fashionistas that you all are, um, you need to set all this stuff and have this sort of ready on the side. Don't forget the hard hat. The hard hat, no open toe and shoes. I still have it all. <laughs> <laughs> Flashlights, batteries, gauze masks. Um, take classes about um, health and safety. Um, if you had suffered a mold outbreak, um, a paper mask would not have been sufficient to protect you. So you need to know what would be helpful, and maybe those are some of the kinds of, well, those are the kinds of programs that um, MBLC will offer in terms of health and safety. Um, rope off the building. Make sure you have in your, in your uh, disaster response kit a yellow police line tape so you can make sure you can do that. You're not trying to find it. When the hardware stores are closed, you're trying to find who has some of that. So this is a great list of things that you can use for planning moving ahead. Uh, I wanted to uh, next turn to some of the comments that John made because I think the approach that Springfield Water did is so incredible and it ties. Were you aware of FEMA's whole community concept? No. No? Jack, can I put you on Let's the spot and ask you to talk about it? <laughs> Define what Craig Fugate's vision is of a whole community in FEMA, in the world of FEMA? Uh, <clears throat> probably you'll have to be on the spot. But I think it's probably not. Uh, yes. did during the break, and he hit on, on a half a dozen points that are very key, as did Katie and uh, Margaret and Trevor always does too. And, and I, I guess what I would start is with a disclaimer, is that uh, if I have one regret about coming to meetings like this, is that more of the decision makers and the implementers of FEMA don't get to meetings like this and hear what people actually have to do when there's an event or an incident like this. And, and to hear the things that, that you folks were saying that you did is exactly what folks at FEMA need to be hearing. Uh, I mean, I, I come away energized in a lot of ways, certainly informed so that I can do my job a lot better, but very humble after meetings like this when I hear what, what the people actually do. Despite all the scars that we have about coming in <coughs> and providing assistance, uh, you know, it's under regulations and guidance and policy and so forth. Quite frankly, despite all the news articles and so forth, we're very good at it. And we are following our regulations and policies. They're very, very close. But the limitations of what we're able to do in events like this is lost even within FEMA as to what the need in the community is. It is infinitesimal compared to what the need is. And you can catch the need right away when you hear these things. Um, that's just like a little prelude to the whole community business that Laurie was talking about. The agency in recent years has taken on this whole community concept, knowing just what I said. On some level, I don't, our director is a former state director, so he probably has had first-hand experience of some sort. But I'm not even sure how first-hand his experience is, you know, like this. But the point is that he realizes that for community, for society to operate and get back after an event, it needs to be well beyond what FEMA does under the Stafford Act, our regulations, and the guidance that we have. And it takes all of what you folks are doing. I think that I had mentioned to John that he, had, uh, that he hit on, that when there are meetings, even if you're not invited, don't feel like you can't go. I mean, certain personalities, I guess it's easier for them. But if you can get to those meetings, you find out you weren't if not invited because you uh, were overlooked, it's just that I'm not wanted there. It's, it's you're invisible sometimes for the people having those meetings. And if you get there, you can become a key part of it. And then all the way to what he was saying about being a key part of the overall master plan for the city, not just the library section of the city, but now they have a voice in the overall master plan of the city. I mean, that's pretty powerful stuff. And what Kate was saying, I, I know that you did communicate, and this is a, a smaller community than Springfield for sure, and communicating with the local officials and so forth. 
I mean, there's no substitute for that. Uh, in the plans, Greg was talking about the plans being you know, on the shelf, and I think you did draw that you found one. They have to be exercised and looked at, but at least people have to be aware of it so that they know the names of people to call. Uh, because quite frankly, these events, no matter how good your plan is, you're not going to find something that's going to mirror exactly what's in your plan. But if you have the spirit of people that know what's in your plan, that certain things have to be done. You're just so far far ahead that start to make those first calls after the event happens. Uh, Mario, when you mentioned about the recovery centers, that, you know, I think Greg has been pushing this for a long time, that not just introduce yourself to the emergency management community in the state and so forth, but become functional for them. You know, that you're able to help the community and those emergency management people at the same time. But it is that whole community concept. The whole community concept is self-explanatory. Uh, I think you mentioned about a, a, a person that I hadn't even heard of, about a, a restaurant who did yeoman's work out there. And uh, Karen here, the you know, volunteer agency, and Rochelle. There are so many people that do all of this stuff that's way under the radar for us. We're out there implementing the staff that act under the regulations, under our guidance and the policies that we've developed as best we can. Uh, but <clears throat> it, it really is this whole community concept that will be what will make things different, I think, in the future. So that's my idea. Great, great. I think, yes, go ahead. I was just going to add, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to jump back a little bit, put you all on the spot a bit. Um, and that is that, as Margaret was talking about the DRCs, the libraries as DRCs, um, actually one of the women who was in Southbridge was also in Lakeville. Uh, this was following the floods of March, March of 2010. We had libraries in Ulrica, um, Middleton, uh, Lancaster, Quincy, and, and Lakeville who were at one point or another in the DRCs. Actually, Olivia Mello was the director in uh, Lakeville was supposed to be here today and ended up at a board meeting this morning. Uh, but one of the things that we're trying to do, and we're talking a little bit to Jack a little bit about this, is that we're trying to finish up the surveying of the libraries in central and western Massachusetts. So my charge to you, if you would, is to call FEMA and tell them that we need to get this done because they can then push FEMA um, as much as possible uh, to finish up. There, we're looking at now the libraries, not the ones with with uh, meeting rooms because obviously they need to be able to work in and work in the meeting room. But to, to once finish it up with a, a dozen or 15 or so that are um, need to be surveyed before we can then, and FEMA's, they're ready to do this, to start the train, retraining program, or, or restart, I should say, the training program for librarians as to the role that they can play and the role that DRC is going to play. Because we're a natural. Just need to finish that surveying process, and then we can, you know, it got stopped because of Hurricane Irene. And now it's everybody. so we can finish that component. Great. Um, it's a lot of work to get to the stage when you actually are do become a disaster recovery center, and it's a lot of work through the entire process. But certainly, it puts your institution on the map, and people will think differently and more highly of the library more highly than they already do. Um, of, of, of by having that kind of, of, of outreach to the, your community. Um, I also want to uh, underscore what Margaret was talking about, establishing a relationship with your emergency responders. It's, it's so important, and you can see how it's been implemented um, in Springfield, how having that relationship is so vital. So you know, um, the saying is, you don't want to be exchanging business cards with your first responders after disaster happens. So you want to have that, that relationship established and you want to continue to foster that. And so that means inviting them over. Ask them over for uh, functions that you might have at your facility. Um, make sure that you invite all the shifts of your, of your first responders because chances are great. Murphy's Law will say if you only invite the day shift, the disaster is going to happen at night. Um, make sure that you have faces and names associated. Just, make, just pave that path. A little bit more. Uh, there's a wonderful publication that was a book that was written by David Carmichael, who is a former uh, state archivist of Georgia. And David Carmichael's last name is spelled C A R M I C H E A L. 
so it's not how you normally spell my book. And it's called Implementing the Incident Command System in Museums, Libraries, and Archives. Uh, this is what um, something about what Margaret had, had intimated about before. ICS, the Incident Command System, is the structure that all emergency managers use when responding to uh, an event, whether it's small or whether it's huge, whether it's just making sure at a, at a football game that everything, that, that they have all the bases covered. It's kind of weird in the old two there. Um, but this is a, a book that talks you through ICS. Uh, when something happens to your institution, uh, the firefighters, the first responders are going to loom large and they're going to be in charge. And you really see your authority to them until they pass it back to you. So knowing how they operate, it makes all the difference in the world so you can integrate what you're doing with what they're doing rather than being constantly at odds about that. <laughs> you can take the ICS 100 course, by the way, online um, through the FEMA website. And that gives you the basis in addition to the Right, right. So, so no offense, the ICS program online is rather deadly. Um, <laughs> it's just rather boring. This ICS, uh, we won't give you a certificate, but at least it introduces you to the concept and it shows you how you can implement this kind of structure and organization, not just to disasters, but any event that you want to organize, whether it's a function at your at your um, institution, uh, whether it's your wedding, uh, it could be anything. So, I encourage you to use that book. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was, all right, so, so making, making those relationships, establishing those relationships with first responders, um, it means asking them to come to your facility and do a risk assessment, to do a walkthrough of your facility. They are not there to enforce code, although, of course, if there's something really dangerous there, they will mention it to you, but they're not here to issue you tickets or issue you citations. They really want to make sure that they are, that you are aware of some of the hazards that you could mitigate, that you can, some of the threats or some of the, the things that, could, that you could easily correct, um, as well as become acquainted with the layout of your facility. If it's a rabbit warren and something happens, you want them to be able to know their way around. Um, you want them to know where your high priority collections are. So having that relationship established is, is um, very, very important. Lori? Yes. Um, two examples. Uh, prior to coming to the Board of Library Commissioners, I was the Librarian Archivist at the Peabody Museum in Salem. And the building supervisor, this is long before they uh, merged with the Essex Institute, uh, the building supervisor, who was also head of security, on an annual basis invited the fire department in for a uh, reception. Uh, and then we as curators were there because we needed to take them down to where all our storage areas were. And I think you got that one for me because the storage areas at the Peabody Museum were literally a rabbit warren. There was everything under the sun. So we got to uh, take them around and show them the material. And food, by the way, works pretty well, <laughs> um, especially with the firefighters. Um, but one of the workshops that I gave down in, in um, Pembroke, I had using the, the library as if we I often, for those who've been there, remember this, is that I'll often try to get the fire department to come and do a uh, fire extinguisher training in the beginning so that you actually get to handle one and use it rather than just say, oh yeah, it's over there. And most people don't know where they are in the library anyway. Uh, but he said, okay, let's do something. So, and this is a new library. And so he took us on a tour of the library uh, with one of the staff members there writing like mad uh, on the things that he out that were things that could be uh, changed to be beneficial. Uh, and he said, and this is a good one. This is a good building. But the first question he asked was, and we were all sitting in an alcove at the end of the building, he said, if the alarm went off right now, where would you go to exit? And every single one of us pointed to the front door. And yet, 10 feet from where we were, but just around the corner, was an exit door. And one of the things that he pointed out was that the exit sign had been put there before the stacks, the books were put on the stacks. And so as a result, it was totally blocked from everybody. So that moving at the sign so that it was in, a, in a, an invisible position so that we would have known to go right out there rather than going the whole length of the library and out the front door. 
So there are little things that can make a big difference in relation to what it was. A week after he took us on this tour and, and highlighted something in the children's room, the Department of Education came out with a uh, directive saying that all these blankets or quilts or what have you that were being hung in, uh, in that case, in kindergarten, first and second grade rooms, needed to come down as a fire hazard. And he had said there was one in that particular in the children's room that he said this needs to come down because it's a fire hazard and if anything happens, it's just going to cover go to the ceiling and cover the whole room. So, as Laurie said, getting them to come in and go through this picks out the things that then become an issue or a potential issue in relation to uh, how you're going to deal with the disaster. We're beginning to wind down on time, uh, but I, I want to sum it up in, in a way, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, uh, but what often happens, what always happens in these meetings is that everyone gets really jazzed, I mean, they're very inspired, they're great ideas that are forthcoming, um, and then you leave and then your work settles in on top of you and this sort of gets dampened. So I really would like everyone to resolve to do one small thing for emergency preparedness, not necessarily today, but to try to get something going. Um, when did SAA create Mayday? Uh, 2006. 2006. So how many of you have heard of Mayday? It's an initiative, it's an initiative that was started by the Society of American Archivists and is now um, promoted all over the place by many, many different organizations to do one thing for emergency preparedness on May Day. And as all of you know, May Day means help me in French. I didn't know that for a long, 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 long time. Um, and so it's very That's important. May Day, May Day, <laughs> Yes, help. So um, May Day has come and gone, but that does not mean that you have to wait a whole nother year to do something. So I want you to each write something down. You don't have to share it with anybody here, but I would really appreciate it if you went back to your facility, went back to your institution, and shared what happened, share with your colleagues what was discussed here, and bring up the point or points that you would like to have happen, or just start the planning process at your institution. Because again, it is so very difficult to get planning going. And it's always do as I say, not as I do. But really, um, I think having a meeting like this here, following a disaster, helps, helps promote this idea, and I hope fosters your desire to move forward. I think the examples that we've had, that our speakers, again, have been amazing in bringing to us uh, the kind of resilience and response that is cake that is possible um, of course we weren't going to have someone who, like totally lost it but it's really important to be able to be when you are in their shoes to be able to come and speak again about this is how we dealt with the bad hand that we were given and John were after two real quick points um, some of you know but most of you probably don't um, I'm a member of the National Ski Patrol and have been for a long time. Uh, but one of the things that I want to emphasize that I use this on a number of times is that every year we have to go through an eight hour first aid pressure. And the reason for that, besides any updates that may occur, is the fact that you don't know what you're going to get on the slopes in relation to an, 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 an accident. And many times I've found, and I've talked to a number of others who do the same thing, because we've gone through the amount of training we've gone to, we basically go into automatic pilot at that point. And there are things that we automatically know that we need to do. And this is where the, the training comes in and the planning, because you get to the point where you say, okay, I know I need to do this, this, and this, and I'll go to the disaster plan if I have to, because of, you're not going to remember everything. But the, their initial steps that, that need to be undertaken for everybody's safety and for the safety of the collections, etc. Um, the other thing is, keep our, all keep our fingers crossed. Um, we've applied, as many of you filled out the survey, preservation survey, as part of our Connecting to Collections grant, planning, statewide planning grant. We have applied for an implementation grant. If we get it, which will be, we'll know in September, I think, um, we will be scheduling a large number of workshops in all sorts of different areas of uh, preservation, and one of them will be uh, on emergency preparedness. Uh, that will be run in a number of places around the state on a regular basis. 
So, and a final comment is that remember, no matter what we've been talking about today, all disasters are local. To paraphrase, to go near. Greg, I have Just one quick thing. Um, I talked earlier about having an attitude. You, you need to do something. And an example in Springfield is, unbeknownst to the library, <laughs> The city constructed a chain, uh, what do you call it? chain fence across the front of the library as it face, faces the street. So they and we asked, well, what the hell is going on here? Uh, because well, they said that the town, the city was uh, liable if somebody gets hit crossing the street because the parking lot is across this busy street. So we wanted to put up a fence to prevent people from doing it. And of course then they found a way to construct stairs from the parking lot to go down and across the street at just as tough a place and come up. And we said, people aren't gonna do that. So we see a lot of people getting under the fence, you know, it's two, two, two chains across it. Uh, at the same time, in our action plan, we said that we were going to become a welcoming place. <laughs> and the next thing is we said, what if something happened and your first responders couldn't get to the library? Well, <laughs> the earthquake happened, getting people out fire truck pulls in, firemen are trying to squeeze through the two chains in order to get to the building to check out if it's safe. And they were getting stuck because they're wearing all that gear. They couldn't get through. So I was sure to have my cell phone and I took photos of that. Our next endeavor is to show those photos to the city, and you have to sometimes lock horns with people. You have to be assertive, and that's an attitude issue, but it's an important attitude. You don't want to just be that nice place over there, that you're a part of what's going on. And so we're going to be sure that we've, we've constructed uh, signs in six languages welcoming a lot of the populations. So that part's welcoming, but as you approach the building, <laughs> You've got this long, I mean, this is 50 or 60 feet worth of chain. And so we're going to have to do battle with many departments about this, legal especially. But when you know you're right, you have to do it. Okay? So that's just guidance. And it's hard sometimes to do that depending on your personality. But. You have to be, you have to know, in our case, our plan says this. We want to be welcoming. This is not welcoming. And that kind of thing comes up a lot. And stand up for what, and now we know a lot of these players. So it'll be easier for us to, to deal with this and address that issue. And there's going to be, every place is going to have its own issues. So just. Thank you. Um, as a, la oh, yes. Yeah,
provide weather information for the protection of, of life and property. It's not just to provide weather information uh, for the protection of life and property. So if you've got any questions, uh, my email's on the uh, agenda, and uh, feel free to, to uh, send me a message. I'll be happy to try to respond. Great. I hope you get 25 emails uh, <laughs> people. That would be wonderful. Yes, Michelle. Well, I just have a quick FYI. I live in Preservation, Massachusetts, and our concern is primarily historic sites and structures rather than collections. But since a lot of you probably work in historic buildings, I just want to let you know that um, I'm maintaining a list of funding resources and also an access database of preservation contractors and consultants, which I can uh, email to anybody who's interested in. So please feel free to talk to me afterwards. I'll give you my contact information. Great. I think one of the things that the tornado did to us in Coastep was to, even though we had somebody from the Massachusetts Historical uh, Commission on the on Coastep, was really brought home the issue of historic structures, and we really started working very closely then with uh, Preservation Massachusetts in relation to how we were going to address the the concerns of those of the institutions and the individuals who had historic structures that were affected one way or another by the by the tornado. So it's something that uh, when we, we talk about in Costa, when we talk about cultural resources, we're not talking about just the libraries, the archives, the museums, and their and historical sites and their collections. We look at it as we're trying to look at it in as broad a sense as possible, which may mean arboreta and uh, cemeteries as well <coughs> across the board. So um, that's where we're coming from. And thanks to Preservation Massachusetts, we we are a lot more educated and we've expanded that considerably. Great. All right, um, one last thing. You have, a, I hope you picked up a program evaluation form. If you would take a few minutes to fill that out, that would be wonderful. And again, thank you so much to our speakers for enduring what you did and for presenting it so fabulously. And thank you for showing up. I know you all have other things to be doing. Um, these are all, all the people here are resources for you, so take advantage of them. We now have a network of 25 to 30 more people that we didn't have when we started this morning. Um, remember that. Thank you.